So I'm going to introduce a couple of people who then will introduce other people. <laughs> so uh, um, joining us as always and helping everything run smoothly and happen is Leila Taragi, a coordinator, program coordinator with um, ACC Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, and Mark, Dr. Mark Cunningham our film professor who curates and uh, runs this film series for us. Um, also joining us are uh, Dr. Maria Cotera, uh, Cotera uh, an associate professor in Mexican American and Latino Studies Department at UT, the UT across the street from us. And she will introduce, say a little bit more about herself herself. And Dr. Gary Moreno, who is director of ACC Center for Latino and Latin American Studies um, at, did I say ACC? It's never too many times to say ACC, Austin Community <laughs> College. And we are delighted to have him with us too. So Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, to say a little bit more about yourself and then. Oh, just briefly, uh, my name is um, uh, Dr. Mark Cunningham. I am an associate professor in radio in the radio, television, and film department here at ACC. I teach courses in uh, you know media studies, uh, you know film studies, and also teach media literacy courses here at the college. I am currently uh, writing a book for Columbia University Press on John Singleton and uh, his in, in about Los Angeles and race, gender, and narrative in his movies *Boys in the Hood*, *Poetic Justice*, and *Baby Boy*. So. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, as you as you all know about writing <laughs> like this so <laughs> I'm doing a lot of reading a lot of research and stuff too so mm -hmm. I'm happy to be here as usual should we I'll go next yes Maria. Oh, yes yeah <laughs> um so my name is Maria Cotera I'm actually a recent transplant to um uh, to Austin, although I was born here and I did grow up here. Uh, I went to graduate school um, first at UT and then at Stanford University and then right out of graduate school, it was a different time. I was hired <laughs> with a postdoc with a guaranteed job after, oh, those days. Those were such good days back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, hired at the University of Michigan um, and had be have been there about 18 years. Uh, I also directed the Latino Studies uh, program there, which is a sub-program inside of American culture, which is a department there. Um, and I am absolutely over the moon to be back here in my um, place of birth and uh, warmer weather. And mm -hmm. although <laughs> oh, yeah. two weeks ago, I was like, what did I do? What did I bring with me? Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to make ties with ACC. My mother was a teacher at ACC, professor at ACC for many years. Um, it's a wonderful institution and uh, so honored um, to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Gary? Uh, yeah, I'm also a, a recent transplant here to, uh, to Austin. Uh, Come, coming by way of uh, Oklahoma. I'm originally from California, um, and I teach Mexican and U.S. history at ACC. Uh, I have a forthcoming publication uh, as well with the University of New Mexico Press titled Chavo, the History of a Cultural Icon. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so I'm a cultural historian, and, and uh, I've, I've worked a lot with film, so I, I really enjoyed watching this movie for the very first time, and it really kind of allowed me to return to what was originally my first love, I thought I was going to be a film director, but that didn't kind of begin to explain instead. Wow. Welcome to the club there, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and me, but we have to commiserate about that. Yeah. I just didn't want to end up, you know, filming shoe commercials for the rest of my life. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> oh, man, that's pretty good. Oh, and I, by the way, I just want to say that this is water, not wine. I just thought it was important to point that out. It's just the only glass I could find ready to hand. So I don't want anyone to think I'm not being entirely serious and academic and professional here. It is water. Let's see. That's, hilarious. That's awesome. Man. Okay. Well, Shereen, if you I'll take it from there, then uh, you can start talking about uh, Salt of the Earth. I'm so excited to talk about this film with both uh, Gary and Bria. Uh, if you all don't mind saying, 
as opposed to, I mean, we can use uh, formalities if you like, but is, it, is it Gary and Maria cool? I'm good. All right, good deal. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, again, I guess I'm very excited to talk about this movie. As I mentioned to you all uh, prior to the recording that I was introduced to this film when I was in film school uh, by the great Charles Ramirez Berg. And I always say the great in front of his name because Charles has taught me so much. And, uh, you know, and just as, you know, just one of the most, knows more about film than just about anybody I know. And, and uh, he introduced this film to us in, in film school and I've never forgotten it. And so when we, got together, you know, Shireen and Layla and I, you know, to put this, <clears throat> put this program together, put this film series together, uh, I immediately knew that I wanted to talk about this film and, and wanted to include this film because I think it's such an important film for a number of reasons. Uh, and so just a little bit, you know, just to, for those, I'm sure hopefully everyone had a chance to watch it. Uh, but of course we know the movie is about you know, these Mexican American workers who protest these kind of unsafe working conditions and unequal wages, right, compared to their Anglo counterparts at this zinc mine in uh, New Mexico. But then what is born out of that, right, is the support of the women, uh, their wives, who come to their defense when uh, they find that their protest uh, is being challenged and they, and, and they find a loophole for the women to help them. And then it really also kind of turns into this gender battle. Uh, and this kind of feminist uh, exa examination of feminism in some ways too, as, a, as well as, you know, labor conditions, but also too, uh, this discussion about being Mexican or being Mexican American, which I thought was incredibly interesting. And so it's, I'm just so happy to have this conversation with you all. So let's just get started. Let me ask you, uh, you know, the very first question, which is, you know, in, in, in looking at this film and kind of thinking about this movie, uh, why is it, you know, why is this film, in, in Gary and in Maria, your opinion, why do you feel this movie would be so important to our understanding of both Mexicans and Mexican Americans historically and currently? Mm -hmm. I'll let Gary go first. No okay. follow up. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, there's a long history of organized labor within the Mexican American community. You know, you can, go back to the UFW, the United Farm Workers, talk about Cesar Chavez, uh, but it's very long, you know, and that's, that's what struck me uh, about the movie when I started watching it. Maybe it's because I had just been lecturing about the Mexican Revolution, mm -hmm. but I mean, really, you can take some of these issues that are raised all the way back to that, to that, to that moment in time, uh, you know, the Cananea Copper uh, strike, uh, which was so instrumental to you know what eventually became the, the Mexican Revolution, uh, you know, but but you can take it on beyond there. I mean, you can talk about Ludlow, right? The Ludlow massacre, where there was a, a, a large percentage of, of of Mexican workers there as well, and then you know the pecan shellers strike here in in, in San Antonio. As, mm. as well. That's that's the image that came to me, and that's where kind of it, it all fit uh, within my mind. But I mean, I'm a historian, so that's kind of logical that it would go that way. Mm. So. That's why I think it's important, you know. And you know, talking about some of the struggles of today, you know, we're 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 at a point where I think uh, these issues are coming up again, uh, be, you know, in or, in uh, amongst laborers. So so it's important to revisit it now. I think for that moment. Mm -hmm. okay. So I have a unique relationship to this film, and I should say something a little bit about what my current work is. So since two thousand and nine. I have been building a very large digital repository documenting Chicana feminism in the 1960s and mm -hmm. 70s, largely inspired by my mother and her generation, who my mother just joined us, by the way. So, mm -hmm. um, so that project is called Chicana por mi raza, and it involves, you know, we have a very large uh, repository of oral histories and archival objects, some 10,000 archival objects and nearly 200 oral histories, thousands of hours of oral history. Um, and uh, one of the things that has been so interesting looking at this archive, so I, well, let me just backtrack. What I want to say is that the question of um, uh, the voice of women in this film uh, is really profound and way ahead of its time, because at this time, the Communist Party right, is having pretty pitched battles. right? So it was made in, I think, 1952. Um, <laughs> 
54. Yeah. So like they're, they're the Bracero, so you know, you have the Bracero um, issue in California and uh, the beginnings of Operation Wetback, right? And so within the CPUSA, there's all these battles that are happening around the question of the women's question and also around race, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, especially in California, CPUSA uh, groups are, are, are debating, right? Um, particularly Mexican Americans in those groups. Um, are debating the 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 attention that the Communist Party is or is not giving to these issues. Mm -hmm. To me, this is a propaganda film um, and likely connected to the CPUSA. I don't have a problem with that personally. Um, I don't I don't think you know. I, I think um, at this time it's a difficult time to make propaganda films. Uh, the CPUSA is largely retreating and undercover. Some of the women, not the women we interviewed, but their mentors. Uh, in particular, Francisca Flores, who was a leading uh, light in the organizing in San Diego and later LA in the 50s, um, 40s and 50s and into the 60s. Uh, she was uh, involved with the CPUSA and she had um, a copy of this film, a real, like a, a, a big old reel. Yeah, in the can, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. and in the 1960s, she was almost single-handedly responsible for reviving it. She would do showings in, you know, community bookstores and mm -hmm. centers. And, you know, by the late 1960s, Chicanas who are emerging in their feminist consciousness within the Chicano movement are citing salt of the earth mm -hmm. as an evidence of a long history of women's organizing um, in uh, these these uh, spaces that had exclusively been male spaces for organizing. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, so for me, like the connection to this film is not just in terms of like the incredibly um, prescient, you know, way it discusses politics in an intersectional way, but also um, the way it became a keystone or touchstone uh, media object for Chicana feminists who had almost nothing like it, mean, they didn't have anything like it. There were no films about Chicanas. There were, you know, so this is the closest thing they had. And this film also in its representation of women's issues and how they organize, gave them something to sort of, you know, model on and mm -hmm. say like, this is not what we're doing is not any different than what they did. We have a long history of organizing. So to me, this film has like multiple levels that are historical, both in its making and that moment for the you know um, left um, and and people of color in the left, and also for the 1960s, a later moment in which it is uh, monumentally important. Well, I mean, you bring up something, Maria, that I think is 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 very interesting. I mean, this is a question I also had, so I want to piggyback on first your statement about this being very much so a propaganda film. And then yeah. I want to uh, circle back and ask you and Gary a question about the feminist leanings in the film as well too. Uh -huh. So I mean, Gary, a little bit, you were talking about like some of the things in YouTube, uh, Maria, where you were talking about uh, some of the things the film reminded you of and like, you know, with my knowledge as, as a black man and what I know and what I've learned over the years about Mexican and Mexican American history, just kind of reading uh, Victor Villasenor's book, Reign of Gold, kind of really reminded me of yeah. some of the events that kind of happened. So I really like that book. Uh, and so, uh, but, uh, and I wonder why nobody's made a movie out of that, if I could just throw that in there. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but yeah, but this, it kind of reminded me of those same kind of struggles in terms of labor and kind of relationships between men and women, where I think it you know, becomes very important and kind of stands out mm -hmm. and, and, you know, within this history. But just to kind of backtrack a little bit and kind of go back to the notion of, uh, of, of propaganda. Uh, so Pauline Kael, the celebrated film critic, yeah. Pauline Kael, said of Salt of the Earth in Sight and Sound magazine in 1954 that this movie, she said, first of all, she said it was kind of a left-leaning film. And, and of course, knowing Pauline uh, as curmudgingly, right, as uh, uh, Pauline Kael can be uh, sometimes, a contentious maybe even in some ways, uh, but still an incredible critic. But she said that the film was as clear a piece of communist propaganda as we have had in many years. So Yay. why <laughs> <laughs> <You're> gonna, <hey. laughs> Power to the people, right? right. Uh, so you know, why was the film, do you think, seen as pro-communist and even <laughs> pro-labor by some people? And what stands out to you is particularly threatening about this movie, particularly for the mid 1950s? Mm -hmm. 
let me, uh, if, if you don't mind, Maria, can I jump in here? Of course. Yeah, um, so I think, uh, you know, when it comes to this issue, because I also believe with Maria that it's a, you know, communist film in, in, or, or a propaganda film. Really? Um, but it's just pe people, I think, you know, when they make this accusation that we're watching a communist propaganda film, I think people don't know how to distinguish between communism and socialism and all that gets wrapped up into that. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that it's really important to, to be able to distinguish between those two. Mm -hmm. be able to distinguish between communism, you know, and, and socialism. And, and, you know, they're, they're different in, 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 in many regards, but I think one of the most important ones is in, in electoral politics, right? Uh, social, you can have socialism through electoral politics. You can't have communism through electoral politics, right? You have to have like the whole state single party. And, and so that's, that's, I think that's important. Uh, now, I, I, I don't really think that it's a communist propaganda film. I think that it would be more on the level of a socialist propaganda film. And, and, and I don't know if you can slice it that way, but it's, it's important to, to make that distinction. And, and I know Pauline Kael made this comment, comment that you know, it's a communist propaganda film, but we have to question that, uh, I think. Um, and even, even if we wanna divide it even further, we can, right? We can talk about uh, the radical politics along the borderlands uh, around this time, right? Uh, you can relate it back to Magonismo, right? To the Magon brothers, who are bringing a lot of these socialist ideas to workers along the border uh, through their publication of uh, you know, pu newspapers, Regeneración. There's uh, a couple images uh, in the film in which they show Benito Juarez, right? And this is supposed mm -hmm. to you know, convey to you how Mexican they are, how much pride they have in their Mexican history perhaps. Um, and I think that was, Benito Juarez is kind of like a stand-in symbol for people's Mexican identity, especially early on in cinema. I think what would have been a, a more relevant uh, image to put up there for them to revere, which was probably what, what most people had uh, in their homes along the border, uh, is a, a image of the Magón brothers, because mm. you know they were really important and influential in bringing some of some of these ideas uh, to the border to the United States. You know, they 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 basically exported the revolution, uh, you know, over the border, and so these ideas, even once the Magón brothers are gone. Uh, these ideas stay and they become then, you know, the basis upon which other people can build socialism and with communism if they wish. So wow. that's, that's, that's my thoughts on that. Wow. All right, Maria? You know, I do think it's a propaganda film, but I agree with Gary that it is not a communist propaganda film. And in fact, I would say that it contests some basic tenets of communism mm -hmm. and particularly communism's exclusive focus on class. What I think that this film is, it, it, you know, what makes, what distinguishes this film um, is that in its focus on race, on the equal importance of race and racial identity and gender and issues surrounding gender um, and not allowing class, right? It, it is a critique of the, of the class exclusive um, sort of framework of communism at, at let's say emerging from the 1930s, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, it's a labor film, but I also think it's a labor film that is very complicated. I mean, because w for one thing, I mean, it's incredibly sophisticated and nuanced in its analysis because it's basically saying, you know, um, the hidden labor of women is exploited labor as well as every bit as the uh, labor of minors that's obviously being exploited as exploited labor, right? So that, um, you know, the, the, the way in which the film inserts the quote unquote women's question, which was mm -hmm. a major issue and also the race issue, which was a major issue for the popular front in the 1940s and 50s. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, is the reason why Mexicans, blacks um, and other folks left the popular front and women left the popular front because of the class exclusive prism. And so for me, this film is, um, is very unique in its intersectional presentation of um, the oppressive force of capitalism and its impact on a community. And the other thing I think is really important about this film is, and touches on what Gary was saying, that in its presentation of the struggles of um, rural Mexicans, mm -hmm. not as exclusively land-based, though that is part of the, their struggle. Clearly it's articulated in the film, but as a labor struggle, 
that is quite unusual because there's a very romantic vision right at this time of Mexicans as an agrarian. Well, it's not romantic, but you know, capitalist vision of Mexicans as a, an agrarian labor force exclusively, mm -hmm. right? And so this showing that they were actually, you know, a laboring force that's much more akin or has, you know, connections to a white laboring force, miners. Mm -hmm. It's it's presenting a very um, unusual picture of Mexicans at the time and their, you know, prevailing issues. Well, I think it's really interesting you bring that up too. That's something that had stood out for me too. That it it, it was zinc mines, right? And this, you know, and kind of getting away from this kind of stereotypical argue, argue idea that it's just like you know strawberries and agricultural, you know, but the fact that it moves into this space, right? Mm -hmm. And like you say, and you see them negotiating with and working with white miners, and still making it very clear to them, right, that your struggle is not my struggle. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I love the scene where they were talking about, yeah, if I asked him who this was on the wall, he wouldn't be able to tell me. But I know everything, you know, mm -hmm. that he has to, you know, you know, about his side and whatever else. And I think that's, you know, for, you know, for people of color, that is something that, you know, black people, people of color, all of us, that's something we mm -hmm. certainly can point to and say, you know, you don't need to know anything about us to be considered well read, well versed, well anything. But we, in fact, have to know it, our stuff and your stuff in order to get. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anything done, so to speak, right? If anything done, right? So Sharina asked the question here that I think is also to kind of piggyback on what you were saying about capitalism, uh, Maria, where she says, so by this standard, <laughs> we say, right, that many films are military war propaganda and almost all films are capitalist propaganda. Yes. <laughs> I mean, all films are propaganda. It's yeah. not, you know, it's just what side they're, they're, you know, propagandizing. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, agreed. That's the, I thought the same thing, Shireen. You know, <laughs> good deal. So, so let me uh, move to the gender and the feminism front here. And, uh, and so, and, and ask this question. So I often tell my students this, right? That patriarchy knows no racial or class bounds, <laughs> right? That's the one thing that, that seemingly from a, from a patriarchal standpoint, all the races seemingly kind of agree on that, unfortunately. So I think, right, we certainly see the influence of a patriarchal society on the characters who populate Salt of the Earth. Uh, so sp speak to the feminist leanings on display in the film. And do you think this perspective supersedes the social class discussion in the film? Or do you think that it works in tandem with it? Or is, of course, right, can we, you know, can both of them stand strong, stand by side? Side by side. Yeah, I mean, I think that the remarkable achievement of this film, and this certainly is borne out by the second my my recent watching of it, mm -hmm. is that it inter the way in which it interlaces the question of gender with the question of class. Mm -hmm. It is that is so powerful and so beautifully done. It's not easy to to articulate a, an intersectional analysis in filmmaking. <laughs> Like that is truly not an easy, it's not easy to articulate it in theory, right? right? And and in our practice or, you know, so I think, you know, one thing that, that was very striking for me was, um, you know, when by, by the end of the film, you know, with that famous sort of last set of lines where she's like, now, you know, we have dignity, right? That that's what we've won is dignity. To me, you know, that it takes on a different meaning after everything that has transpired, which essentially is a struggle for dignity, for women's dignity inside a, a struggle for, for labor dignity and for racial dignity as well. Like, so for her to articulate that is really important. Um, I think it also is really interesting that, um, that, that the film presents it, um, presents this struggle for dignity and this um, patriarchal stance of the community as not in a very nuanced way. Mm -hmm. So if you recall the town meet or the meeting when yeah. they're determining whether women can take the lead, right? There are men there that stand for them, right? Yes. The love story between Rosario Revueltas and Juan Chacon, like that is one case in which you have a conflict. That's what makes that conflict so interesting, mm -hmm. right? Because he is not with those men. But I think what's what's really critical in the film is that the film is portraying the fact that there is nuance inside of this patriarchal community and that some men are able to see, right, without having to do the laundry, right, and experience what women experience, yeah. they're able to see 
um, possibly because of their class critique, uh, you know, or whatever reason, they're able to see that it is valid that women take the front role right. in this particular situation because they're the ones um, who have the power. The men are being shut out because of legal maneuverings and all of this. Do, yeah. do, you, do you all, do, Gary, you and Maria, do you all think that there's something to the fact that we see the white woman being a little bit more outspoken with her husband in some ways than we see uh, the Latinas being with their husbands? Do I see, do I see meaning in that? Well, I'm just saying, do you, I mean, am I, I mean, am I, am I off base there by kind of pointing that out? Particularly I, I, to tell you the truth, that, that hadn't even crossed my mind. I, that's something that I didn't pick up on. Um, but I, I agree that, you know, the gender, the gender issue supersedes the class issue in this movie. Maybe, I think in retrospect, looking at it now, I think that, that the gender issue is dealt with in a much more complex way uh, than the class issue is dealt with. Um, you know, the nuance uh, that Maria was talking about in the patriarchy that it talks about, how, you know, not all, not all the men, you know, believe that their women should stay at home. I think that was really, you know, until she said it, I hadn't really thought about it, but, you know, it's true. It's, it's, it's much more nuanced and much more sophisticated than, than the class argument. I think the, that hasn't really aged very well. Um, but, you know, it, it speaks to other issues, I think, in, in the patriarchy and the Chicano movement that we get in the 1960s and 70s. That's what I was reminded of. A lot of these issues of like women participating and having their voice heard, you know, you could you could you could say that 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 wasn't you know only occurring uh, in terms of you know organized labor, but it was occurring throughout uh, Mexican American uh, culture, you know, and uh, even within the Chicano movement, uh, you know, if you've read any, any of those early Chicano works, you know that 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 some of those works uh, have very dated language. Everything is is male in orientation, right? It's the Chicano movement and it's not the Chicana movement. It's not until like the, the 80s when women really start to, 70s and 80s when women start to assert themselves that, that then, you know, that gets called into question. So, so mm -hmm. I think that's really, <clears throat> the, the gender issue is way, way, way more complex, I feel like than the class. Am I off base with that? Maria, you think about the way I was, the way I talked well, about- Well, no, I mean, I do think it's actually, it's, it's suggested in the film. Right, um, uh, that that the the white woman, the wife of the organizer, mm -hmm. is um, uh, it's suggested by I believe one of the protag male protagonists that she's coming around and riling the women up. Yeah. Um, but what I think is interesting about that is it's clearly not true because the first person to come and talk to to the the main female protagonist now I can't remember her name. Uh, um, is another is a compañera is is a, yeah. a woman uh, a, you know a loudmouth uh, Mexicana who is mm -hmm. like you know um, and her husband is warning her away from her so I mean I think um, you know I, I I think you know touching on something that Gary said I I feel like in the Chicano movement. Um, Chicanas were very vocal really from the late 1960s forward, but they were often accused of being agringadas or like listening to white women, right? Mm -hmm. Or, um, and, and mm -hmm. that feminism was, uh, you know, an, uh, an, an import of, you know, white supremacist right. culture and it was gonna divide the movement and all this discourse, you know, and that is why I think that the, the film resonated so deeply with Chicanas in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, it was considered canonical for them. Mm. Right. And so the film has this whole other history of being discovered by, you know, early adopters amongst Chicana feminists mm. um, and being a consciousness raising tool for them. So I think it's it's there's little question that that, you know, when you ask like, well, what resonates more, the gender question or the class question, the way it gets taken up in the 60s is because of the gender question. I mean, that is what moves it, propels it forward. Um, mm -hmm. So with that in mind, let me ask you this: ask you all this question. What does the film gain by largely having Esperanza serve as the narrator? What does the film gain from that? Gary, do you want to <laughs> go first? <laughs> I think it breaks, it allows for, you know, there to be a break with the idea that women, you know, can't get involved in the movement, right? That women right. should be quiet. Uh, it, it attacks that very directly by having her be, you know, the, the character that carries the narrative. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's this whole idea of peace comes in the form of a woman mm -hmm. and, you know, based on some of those representations, it doesn't because, you know, the women are 
in there throwing punches, right? Yes. Uh, they're very willing to throw in punches. That that scene uh, of the uh, when the woman is run over in the car. Yes. Know? And then that kind of like was, I think, uh, really, it's it was a, a shocking scene the way it was filmed. I think for its time and day, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to see women just throwing punches and taking those guys out of the car and beating them up. I thought that. Yeah. Was, and then the really chancla. I mean, she. Oh, yeah, that? the chancla. <laughs> he got the chancla treatment. Yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Man, that's awesome. Yeah. What 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 do you think it gains by having her at the at the as the narrator? Well, you know, I don't mean to be presentist or like somehow yeah. I feel that when I I had forgotten she was a narrator. I hadn't seen it no. in many years. And uh -huh. so when when her voice first comes on, you know, what I thought of immediately was testimonio. You know, so I almost like was like in, in that genre, you know, that genre is very explicitly a kind of um, individual story that tells a collective history, mm -hmm. right? The testimonial genre is like, you know, this is, my name is Rigoberta Menchu and this is my story, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me that, that, um, that moment when, when she speaks and that she carries it through with the narrative to me, it was like that made the film seem like a testimonio, right? This, mm -hmm. this is my story, but it's the people's story. Wow. And, you know, we are one in the same. And I, I, and that's why the ending lines, you know, where she invokes dignity and all of this, it was like, it made it more powerful than it, had it not been narrated. Right. And narration is strange in a, in a, yeah. in a, I mean, you, you're a film <laughs> scholar. Yeah. People don't it's, use it very much anymore. I mean, it's, it's like pretty much film noir in the 40s and 50s and outside of that people, you know, and you know, Scorsese, <laughs> nobody, yeah. Really right. yeah. Right, and neorealism. I mean, in some ways, like the realist uh, films, I there, know there's this Mexican film about a little boy. It's made around the same time. Now I can't remember. He loses his donkey. I don't know. Oh, yes, but yes. Do you know what? So it's like a, a neorealist, I think, yeah, I can't remember. It was an American director who made it. But I think that, given the real the neorealist kind of um aesthetics it uh it it gives it a feeling of for some reason it heightens the reality of it and i can't yeah. explain it but uh mm -hmm. because narration is takes you doesn't seem like more realistic but yeah right i mean what you're saying about i mean the italian neorealist style right this kind of you know, and, and for those of you who are with us that don't know, the Italian neorealist style, which is born of movies like, which, you know, which produces movies, I should say, like uh, Roberto Rossellini's Rome Open City and most famously Vittorio De Sica's Bicycle Thieves, mm -hmm. uh, where wanting to, you know, kind of counter this, uh, everything's cool, everything's fine kind of message mm -hmm. the Italian government was sending post-World War II was really kind of showing, you know, really wanted to make films that really kind of showed the working class and the poor and kind of preferencing that, uh, you know, that perspective and using location shots, using non-trained professional actors uh, to kind of, you know, kind of heighten this level of authenticity, all of which this film does, mm -hmm. all of which this movie does. So, you know, I think, like you said, that mixed with this kind of first person account, right? This testimony, right? Uh, testimonial, if you will, really does kind of embolden Right, yeah. the message of the audience that we get from the film, and we really like, like some of us have got an inside track, yeah. right, so to speak, mm -hmm. on on the film and like how things happen for mm -hmm. sure with it. Yeah, it, it's just, it's quite beautifully done. I, I I really I like the fact that she uh, definitely kind of, the way that she uh, narrates this film. So you know, so if, in 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 taking this to our current popular culture climate, you know, and 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 this discussion now that's being had about who should be allowed to tell certain stories, right? Uh, does this film, in you all's opinion, suffer by having a Jewish man, <laughs> Herbert Bieberman, tell this story of this largely Latino-centered group, Latino-Latina-centered group of union organizers and their families? Uh, does it lose something? I mean, would it, would, you know, what would it be different if it had been a Latino or a Latina director, uh, as opposed to this Jewish guy? <laughs> Herbert Bieberman, who I must say, right class, I, I said class because I'm used to teaching, uh, <laughs> but who, who I might say uh, was blacklisted. Yeah. Uh, there's a documentary online, actually, you can see called the Hollywood 10, which he's a part of, including people like Ring Lardner Jr., Dalton Trumbo, whatever, all these people who had you know, refused to name names. 
and were blacklisted. In fact, Bieberman was thrown in jail. Mm-hmm. Actually, and this is the first movie he makes when he gets out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> it's salt of the earth. So, um, so just to kind of give you some context about his struggle there. Uh, yeah, th- you know, with that discussion, you know, does the movie suffer by using, having this Jewish man's perspective in telling this story? I'll let Gary go first. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't think so. I mean, that's my initial reaction. Of course, there's going to be differences with regards to, you know, the way a Latino approaches this versus somebody who's, you know, outside of the culture. But I think, you know, whenever I see Jewish people engage with Latinos or Hispanics or Mexican Americans in the struggle, you know, those those struggles have been very connected, mm-hmm. you know, amongst the Jewish and the Hispanic community. Uh, I just uh, thinking about it, you know, it, it reminded me of like Alice McGrath and the Sleepy Lagoon trial, right? She was a Jewish American. She was fighting, the, she was helping these, these young boys trying to beat the rap that, that was, you know, that they had a, a, these accusations against them. So I don't think so because, you know, the struggle there, you know, of both minority groups have, have often been in common. So mm-hmm. I think that there's a lot that they can share in their experience. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I was more uh, I was more surprised that a a man <laughs> was wow. able to articulate the feminist critique through that narrative that he was able to do that it wasn't made by a woman because to me that film seems like it's made by a woman. I mean, I was I I, I was yeah yeah, and I I would say with 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 along with Gary, you know, at least in LA, right, there there was a lot of Jewish support, uh, left Jew Jewish support for even, you know, early Chicano movement activities. Um, and for sure, you know, alliances. I was thinking about Alicia Escalante, who was a welfare mom who started the East Welfare uh East LA welfare rights um uh, uh organization. For the first year of that organization, it was her Jewish doctor who basically got her office space and paid for her phone line, connected Mm -hmm. her phones, you know, and there's many stories of of that kind of solidarity because of, of course, Jews and and Mexicans were living uh, cheek by jowl in many LA and Southern California neighborhoods because they were being um, systematically segregated. So there's, um, to me, like this, this story, uh, I do think it's remarkable that a person who was not of Mexican ethnicity or heritage mm-hmm. presented these people in a way that was not at all exoticizing or right. romanticizing. Mm-hmm. I do feel it was, it, it, the portrayal was, was dignified mm-hmm. um, and the portrayal of women's struggle was dignified. In other words, it and without romanticizing, right? Without making them like, you know, overly dignified or romanticized characters, like warts and all, but they had dignity. They struggled for dignity and they achieved it. And that's what I think makes it powerful. Right. Like you said, the little small things that happened in the story, like her, like Esperanza in the radio, for example, you know, just like you said. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, and the pride that goes with that and how, you know, Ramon is like, you, you, we can't even afford to pay for this. And this is all you care for. She got to go, I wouldn't have to care about this radio if you cared about me. And, uh, you know, it's all of these little, these things like that, like you say, works and all, but it, it's not, uh, it's just this kind of human portrayal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Layla was saying here that she loved the scene where Ramon and, and his colleagues finally come to recognize how essential the demand for plumbing is. That, that is a great scene. <laughs> They're like, we do need water. This makes no sense. I'm like, oh, now y'all get it, you know. <laughs> and they're all, and the women are all like, I've been chopping wood all day, and the first thing he says is, "What you been doing all day?" You know, <laughs> which is hilarious. But yes, like, like uh, a great many of the people in the cast were were non-professional actors, and I look at the end how they split it up and show you who the professionals were and who the non-professionals were. And to be honest with you. I mean, I, I think there are some of them that I could tell were non-professional, but some of them, like Ramon, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said was non-professional. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I never would have said that. Yeah. Uh, I, I would have could have sworn that he was, you know. And then the sheriff is played by Grandpa Walton, so Will Gear, so <laughs> pretty cool. 
uh, I noticed that and all that. So I was like, look at this. Right? So this blade. So he was, Grandpa Walton was a lefty, probably. Yeah, he was a lefty, right? Yeah, because there's no way, right? He'd have done this movie, right? Had he not been. So that, that shows the go, yeah, as it says. <laughs> For real. Um, so here's a question I have for both of you as well. So I came across this question in my research about the film and, and wanted to pose this to you. So the producer, Paul Jericho, and the director, uh, Herbert Bieberman, in an essay that was published in the California Quarterly, I think in 1960, uh, referred to this film as, you know, quote, a love story of two mature and decent people. Yeah. Do you agree with that assessment and, you, and why not? And if you do agree, in what sense is the film a romance for you? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I mean, if, if I'm thinking about, if I want to, let, let me draw this metaphor out because I'm a professor and that's what we do, <laughs> of uh, testimonio, right? The I embedded in the collective and the collective in the I. Mm. Um, when I read that quote, I thought it was really interesting. And I was thinking about what it means. What is the significance of this love story where these two mature and dignified people are coming into a greater consciousness of each other's struggle? Mm. Right. So just as Ramon is understanding his wife's struggle of, you know, housework because he mm. has to do it, she has taken his role and is understanding what it means to be put in jail, to be attacked by police, you know, and to hold strong. Right. So it's like they're switching. It's like a Freaky Friday in northern New Mexico, uh, except for the husband and wife. Oh. Um, but anyway, um, and then I started thinking about like, so, so the love story is that they, they, I guess they can't really love each other until they know each other's struggles mm. in, in the fullness of, of those struggles. But then I was also thinking about how their embedded, their love story is embedded in a, a larger story, mm -hmm. right? And there's that moment, um, which is so profound when they're being evicted, right? Yes. Um, Esperanza and, and her family are being evicted and the entire community comes together and as their object their their beloved things are being taken out of the room the women and the children and everyone are grabbing them up and taking them in the back door right yeah. and to me like that moment um signifies the solidarity as of that community coming together the love that they have for each other more than really even the struggles that they're having on you know the line and all of those moments of collective action it's that moment in the domestic space where the community is coming together to prevent this horrible thing from happening or to undo it as it's happening and so you know for me it's a love story of community and solidarity as much as it's you know thematized right through the mm -hmm. love of these two individuals it's also a kind of bigger story about how there can be no solidarity or collective enterprise without dignity and respect for all parties, right? Okay. Men and women, children, et cetera. So yeah, that's what I was thinking when I read that quote, wow. like it's a love story encased in a broader love story. Oh, right. What about you, Gary? I think, uh, yeah, it's it's a complicated love story to yeah. say the least, right? It's not a, a easy love story to watch sometimes. I think it makes you cringe at moments. I think the the most romantic scene is the scene of Las Mañanitas, right? When, oh. when uh, you know, when he brings uh, Esperanza, the community, they're all singing, right? And they have a few drinks and they oh, yeah. can't even really afford to pay for the drinks, but they all have a good time and she remembers that for the rest of the week you know yeah. i think that was the moment where, okay that's a nice that's a nice scene and but but later on i think some of the issues that she begins to have with him you know you know the, he, he becomes a, the, the the kind of gossip of some of the women that she's the, he's not supporting her right yeah. it, it elicits a response from the other women like hey your husband kind of sucks yeah. right <laughs> um, and they don't uh, mind so, telling him that either right <laughs> but I think it's a little, it's dignified. I think her long suffering, you know, woman thing that, that, that she does, it, it's dignified and expected maybe for the moment, but there was moments where I was like, uh, I don't know if that would fly today, you know, or <laughs> like when he doesn't even, when he refuses to take the baby uh, yeah. while she's on the picket line, it's like, wow, that's, you're a jerk, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, I found myself a lot of times saying that and thinking about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Ramon is his name, right? Correct. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that just kind of. It, it, I thought it was uh, machismo. His machismo was a little old school and a little bit dated. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I tell you what though, I love that scene though when she dresses him down in that bedroom. She says uh, uh, many rooms in this house, and you can pick anyone to sleep in, but not in here with me. She comes up to the doghouse, right? <laughs> when, when he was raised, like, uh-uh. Yeah. <laughs> that's he raises his hand at her. Uh-huh. Yeah, he did. Even, she said, uh-huh. The, oh, and that's when we learn, right, that he's been hitting her before. Right, right. right. Because she says to him, you know, oh, the old way. I see. Right. Mm-hmm. But she put her foot down that night. She did. But I, it does, it's, I, it's I, also- I clapped a little bit. I did. I was at home. Like, <laughs> <laughs> get him up for us. Get him. Yeah. <laughs> it's also I, I think what's so interesting to me is like it's a story of social struggle and how social struggle uh, always brings up contradictions. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is why, you know, with the Chicanas in the movement, why it resonated so deeply, because even as they're men, you know, we're out there fighting the man and, you know, uh, protecting their communities or whatever. They were oppressing women in the home. Yeah. And keeping women from taking those same roles. And, you know, I think that those, uh, many of those men grew in the movement because women articulated fierce and strong selves and in the movement, um, working alongside them as compañeras, you know, so not all of them. Some remained, um, you know, uh, unrepentant uh, sexist, but um, many of them grew. And the opportunity for growth is what I think is to me what signals the dignified representation of men and women in this film. It's like Mm -hmm. the opportunity to to grow out of those old ways and into a new way of being. That is like, Mm -hmm. you know, the true, I think, hope gesture in the film. Yeah. Um, A couple comments here. Shireen says she loves the connect. She loved that connect she was talking that you were talking about. And also uh, thought a touching scene was when Ramon tells Esperanza that it was their son Luis who reminded her of her Saints Day. Uh huh. I know that made me very Luis. sad. Luis was a good boy. <laughs> he Luis was a good, good boy. boy. Luis was a good boy. Yeah. He was he the one that was born uh, during all this. No, no, no. That's the old. No, one. that's uh, Juan. Juanito was yeah. born during yeah. those. Yeah. And that's kind of chilling what she says at the beginning, right? When she says that she doesn't want to have a baby to bring. Yeah. Baby. Yeah, that, that was like, wow, that's a pretty heavy way to start something. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it, you know what it reminded me? It reminded me of kind of something that Toni Morrison touches on in Beloved in Margaret Garner's real story that the slave women that would rather have killed yeah. their children, right, than have them endure that pain. It very much so reminded me of that same sacrifice when she did that. And then immediately when she's giving birth, she's like, God, forgive me. Like, I take it back. Yeah. You know? But, but, you know, but the fact that that willingness, right, to say, you know, I would rather sacrifice this child than bring him into this is mothering as well, yeah. right? That's very much so mothering. That sure. scene though, like what really was so striking to me about that scene is that he's being beat, beaten yes. uh, by the cops at the same time that she's giving birth. And I'm like, whoa, what's going yeah. on here? Yeah, the I, cops cut those scenes, right, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, I don't know what to make of it. You're the film scholar, so you can tell me. But you know, but but I mean, you know, that cross cutting, and you know, where you where it's this kind of, you know, cutting back between two, you know, two different things where it looks like a simple, like a single scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it is to juxtapose, right? Like this notion, I think of of life, and then what life will be like when he when the child gets here. So it really mm-hmm. does kind of reinforce what mom was saying, Esperanza was saying at the very beginning, of mm-hmm. why she didn't want the child to come. Mm-hmm. Is that and that and that cross cutting reinforces that mm-hmm. that you bring them here and this is their lot in life, mm-hmm. right? Through no doing of their own. Yeah, you know that 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 this is what you know all in the name right of fair of fairness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, fair wages. They're not asking for anything special here. Mm-hmm. You know, they're asking for just like you know what you would give to any you know any decent person would give to a human being. You know, mm-hmm. and the struggle that goes along with that. That, that, that comes with that. And I think that thing really, that cross cutting really does kind of inf- reinforce that for sure. And it does connect the struggle of, of, the, of women with the struggle of men. They're different. Yeah. Like it's saying, they're yes, struggling. they're different, but there is a connection here. And it's just a matter of these two finding what that is and, you know, and working together to, to do something about it. You right, know? absolutely. Yeah. Jennifer uh, says, here's a question, says, we read that the lead actress was deported after the film came out, which is true. Yes. She said, do we know if, if any of the other non-professional actors encountered backlash after being in this film? 
Uh, I read that there was some pushback in other ways, but not to the degree of what they did to her. Right. Well, as a Mexican citizen, that is one way that they could, you know, harm her. I thought it was during the making of the film, actually, in, in order to stop the film from being presented. But that may just be apocryphal. That's that's what I thought. But I don't know if that's true. Um, but at this time, you know, like I was talking about Francisca Flores, who was a huge fan of this film and a leader in the Chicana movement for many years. She went underground during this period mm -hmm. um, in the late 40s, early 50s for like three years. She disappeared from FBI surveillance. So there was a quite a lot of pressure on Mexican Americans and I'm sure others, you know, other communities who were left leaning or who were actual members of the communist party. So it was a, a hard time to make this film. Yeah. And you know, we also can't forget the experience of uh, Dolores del Rio around the same yeah. time period, right? Her Absolutely. career. What's the name again, Gary? Dolores del Rio, the actress. And, oh, Dolores del Rio, okay. Oh, yes. yes. Because, you know, she experienced much the same thing where she yes. was labeled as a radical and her, her career in the United States was yeah. destroyed. And so she had to go to Mexico to finish off her career there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was really unfortunate that she kind of got wrapped up in that whole McCarthy era. I actually think it was Leo Carrillo who wrapped her up. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, gossip. I don't know. I've always speculated. I've done a lot of work on Leo Carrillo and uh, uh -huh. you know, I, I feel like he was pointing things. Yeah. You know, this, I mean, that, and that's that's another question. Like, you know, how does knowing that many of these filmmakers were blacklisted and victims of McCarthyism and, and so the people involved in the film, you know, how does that affect the way we read or think about this film? Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, to what degree is, is the film in a lot of ways? I mean, certainly it's dealing with its own issues in terms of, uh, you know, labor and feminism, you know, amongst uh, Mexican people. Uh, mm -hmm. But to what degree, as a lot of films, you know, did during this time, but kind of is metaphor. I'm thinking about like, you know, what Arthur Miller does, for example, in The Crucible. You know, how much is this is metaphor mm -hmm. for also some of this kind of more communist, you know, uh, this punishment, right, uh, uh, by McCarthyism mm -hmm. uh, in this film? Well, I mean, I think the obvious, you know, or one perhaps obvious answer is it's a reason the film does not get wide release. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, by the time folks start picking up on it, like, you know, folks like Francis and the uh, Francisca in the late 1960s, um, it had been lost really to cinema. I mean, it was not a film that people knew about. And so really it's through the efforts of, that generation of Chicano activists, particularly Chicanas, who you know showed the film, reviewed it, like they would show it at community centers, right, mm -hmm. and schools and churches, and um, it's reviewed all across the radical feminist press at this time. Like you know, it exists because its reviews are popping up, you know, by the by 1970 forward, you know, in things like um, the Third World Women's Liberation newspaper. You know, uh, so so it's being reviewed across a kind of a print culture, across uh, radical women of color uh, print cultures, um, mm -hmm. and and so yeah, I think it's disappearance and resurgence because of activist intervention is that that film history that it has mm -hmm. is a direct result of um, of uh, of the McCarthy era and the silencing of um, films like this. Gary. Mm -hmm brave to, to make this movie mm -hmm. back in the day. I think that was, yeah. it strikes me as being something completely odd that, you know, Hollywood even let get in under its radar. I think, <laughs> you know, yeah. it kind of boggles the mind that, that, sure. that it was even produced and even they went through with it. But it seems like they were working in isolation too, which probably uh, helped them, you know, helped them to get the message out. Yeah, Northern New Mexico. I mean, also, you know, just like it would be hard to keep track. You, you know, I don't know. You'd have to be a pretty intrepid FBI surveillance dude to, to <laughs> track them all to the way to Northern New Mexico. I've been there now and recently, and it's not that easy to get around. I think yeah. it's notable too that uh, it came out like one or two years after the actual strike, right? So these these people yeah. were like revved up and ready to go and ready to say something. Right to the to the outside world about what they had just experienced, mm -hmm. uh, and that that's a brave thing to do. Oh yeah, that's incredible. That you know, someone asked, well, they were surprised to hear that they were not professional actors. They were strikers. Yeah. 
And, and so one thing I was thinking about, like, uh, you know, what does it mean to represent an experience that you had in a social movement two years after, like following what Gary said, a- after you experienced it? Mm-hmm. I mean, that that performance, you know, is it's just I it, it would be, you know, I think like the closest corollary I can think of is like, you know, a Black Lives Matter or Movement for Black Lives film starring Alicia Garza and like all of those folks who start like, you know, it's, it's kind of incom- it's, it's inconceivable really mm. um, to think like what kinds of, um, yeah, what it takes to, to represent, you know, your struggle just a few years after on film. Uh, Shireen asked, how was it financed? I think it was through, what, uh, it, through unions and, and things yeah. of that nature. Yeah, it's how it was financed. I mean, it was very much so. I mean, I mean, you want to talk about grassroots? It's a grassroots campaign to make this film. I mean, it was almost undercover. Right? It had to be right because of the subject matter that they were dealing with. Um, you know, it's so funny you mentioned a, a, a Black Lives Matter film. Something that stuck out to me that was I was watching the movie again last night, and I just not, not too long ago have have, has, have watched uh, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. All oh, right. And immediately, the the tattletale. Mm-hmm. I say it's always one. <laughs> I say every race of color, we got one that'll give us up. What, <laughs> how, what did you all think about that character? I mean, because he like boldly, he didn't even try like to hide himself. He just sat there and picked him out and just told, and that's the leader. And that's what's his, that's his wife. And I was like, oh my God, mm-hmm. you know, and he was already a scab to begin with. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the fact that he was used in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, to to get that, I mean, did that, did that did, did, do y'all have did y'all have the same reaction when you watch it? Like, oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> I had the Judas and Black Messiah and you know thing in mind too, and also you know like surveillance, you know, in the nineteen sixties, also being such a you know a reality of every social movement with. Yes deadlier, I think, uh, impacts for uh, Black and uh, Native lives, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, for sure, people were were killed and infiltrated and imprisoned uh, in the Chicano movement as well. Yeah. And I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, earlier in labor movements. Right. Yeah. I mean, someone was surveilling Francisca Flores, like, everywhere. Yeah. So it's like surveillance is like a fact of life uh, of, of um, justice movements. Uh, yeah you know, from the beginning, I would imagine. Yeah. And I, I think also in like a, uh, just Latin American or Mexican American film, the, the notion of el vendido, right? Uh-huh. Like a linchista who somehow it's supposed to, you know, sell out the culture in, in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that I think is a really powerful one. They call him a, a rompe huelgas, I think is, is mm-hmm. what they refer to him mm-hmm. as. Um, uh, you know, and I, what struck me is that I think he was among the non-professional actors. Am would I you- correct? The 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 the, yeah. the guy who sells him out. He was on the yeah. He was a non-professional. He was yeah. So for a minute, I was like, was he the real guy? That the was, actual uh, scab. Of not, you know, but <laughs> but in the blending of reality and and, and fiction here, you mm-hmm. can't really question it. Really? This is interesting for real. So look, yeah. I see this movie's discussion of union organizing and even you know, but feminism as well is just as significant as is for example as what Barbara Koppel does right in in, in Harlan County, USA, which is a brilliant documentary. And certainly, right, this is a fictional account of what happens. But, but why do you think this movie has not received a reevaluation or resurgence over the years? I mean, I know it's not exactly obscure, but you know, it's, it isn't, I mean, always part of the larger discussion that we have about socially conscious works of art in popular culture. And I mean, I know the reason it's, it's the movie is in the public domain now because nobody bothered to uh, uh, you know, update the copyright in 1982 wow. so in the public. So it's everywhere now. You go to, you know, every, I mean, and, and, it, and it's up there, but could you speak to that as to why you think this movie still, I mean, I just think this movie should be more widely seen, mm-hmm. more on the tips of our tongues when we talk about movies that, you know, are kind of presenting this, uh, kind of social, particularly now in our concern, the way that we are so focused in our culture now on social justice and mm-hmm. and, and transformation of culture and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. Do you want to go? Uh, or Okay, so, you know, I think, first of all, I'll say that Harlan County, USA, uh, talks about white people, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, mm-hmm. number one, 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, well. <laughs> Uh, not to be too facetious, but I mean, I also think that as a document, I, it's been many, like, admittedly, 20 years since I've seen Harlan County, USA. Uh, but, you know, um, there's also a kind of um, a fil film critic appreciation for auteur documentaries. Uh, so I feel like the documentary as a kind of low budget, mm -hmm. uh, uh, realist uh, film genre mm -hmm. is more appreciated mm -hmm. than the the sort of um uh you know i i think we we, would, we could call it a neorealist but i do think that that salt of the earth is a little bit different in that it seems to be a mashup of a documentary and a mm -hmm. narrative film right so it's as a genre it's it's complicated and strange mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because again, as as folks have noted, it, it uses non actors, people who are actual participants. Um, it has narration, but it's narrated by an actress. It's mm -hmm. a narrative film, but it's representing. Uh, you know, you could have made a documentary about the strike as it was happening, right? And so I think that because of its generic quirkiness, you know, it's um, maybe hard to put in a box like if you were you teach film classes right so where would you put this one right i mean i would put it in the same discussion that we have with something like a bicycle thieves we don't say right. that about bicycle thieves right we right. celebrate that and that's heralded as one of the best movies ever made and then here right. this movie is which is still right this kind of undiscovered gem which i yeah. really think is troubling i mean uh because it's it's working in the same spaces as as uh as a bicycle thieves or a Rome open city. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I, I do think, you know, I was only being slightly facetious. <laughs> I should have said, uh -huh. like, listen, uh LA, <laughs> okay, Los Angeles. I've been there, you know, on occasion. And I will tell you, you know, whatever uh uh the people who are making culture in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. are used to seeing Mexican and Latinx folks and immigrants as uh, as domestic servants. And I honestly think that there is such a deeply embedded racial and class bias in the culture of Los Angeles, um, the film culture of Los Angeles, that it's going to take at least a couple of decades for there to be adequate representation of Mexican, American, and Latinx realities in that town. Um, you know, and it's certainly not going to happen if if folks, you know, I mean, the reason why we've seen gains in representation of black stories and black lives is because people have been out there hustling and yeah. <laughs> breaking their backs inside the Hollywood system. Yeah. And, you know, they, they're struggling. Yeah. Um, but but, you know, um, I feel like um, I feel like there's just such a strong bias in the film world against these stories. Mm -hmm. um, and as there have been against black stories, as there have been against Asian stories, the story of, you know, Minari and how it was, yeah. not, right? You know, it's like, uh, so that's why I think, you know, that it, it you know, I, I think it's just deeply embedded uh, white supremacist attitudes in the culture industry. Okay. Gary, why, do you, why, why, why don't we know this film better, Gary? Um, I think it's, you know, how it presents uh, the labor strike. It, I think it's a little dated. And I think a lot of people, I think it's a lot of people that might turn off some people when, when they begin to watch it, I think. I think we just don't have the language anymore. I mean, we don't, you know, young kids today, you know, don't know about unions, you know? I mean, they, they've grown up in an environment where unions aren't a thing. And so you're kind of speaking this alien language to them about unions. And it's, it's a, like a surreal world almost. Like, where does, it, does this exist? In New Mexico, in the mountains somewhere? You know, it, I feel like there's, because of our present situation, we've gutted unions, right? Uh, they're no longer an everyday thing in people's lives. But I think it's relevant to the moment. Uh, you know, we're talking about $15 minimum wage that's going yeah. through Congress, right? You know, and, and, and issues about, you know, paid leave. I think all of these now that the pandemic has, has brought them to the fore, uh, you know, it, it's worth reevaluating. But yeah, I think you're always going to get a little bit of resistance uh, just because kids don't know about unions. You know, I have, I have family members who are in the IBEW and I've seen firsthand how unions can, you know, get you to another class or at least secure your position within the middle class or the mm -hmm. working class, you know? 
not a lot of people have that, you know, especially when you're watching this movie, perhaps from a right to work state like Oklahoma, was, where, where I came from, you know, so mm. I think wow. the, the language is not there for most young, young viewers. But I mean, I, I also think, I mean, you're asking like an auteur question, right? You're, you're also asking like why in the film criticism world or in the film. Yeah, or even just in the way that we think about film and talk about film and uh, you're right. I mean, they're in certain, in spaces, there are these movies that pop up all the time, right? And, yeah. and, and this doesn't pop up in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, you know, I'm thankful that I, it, it was shown to me I'm aware of it, you know, but then I think about so many of my students, I, I, and this is something I think about with my students who are Mexican and Mexican American, my students who are Latino, you know, period, or Spanish, uh, and they have no idea about Mexican filmmakers and they have no idea. And I'm like, I, I'm, saying, I'm teaching this to you, like, yeah, <laughs> how are you not know, you know, and so I turn them on to these you know, these Mexican filmmakers and they come back to me, oh, Dr. Cunningham, what's some other movies I can watch? I say, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you know, and, and, and so I, I just wonder, you know, I worry about uh, how, you know, these movies like this kind of, fall. and again, I'm, I'm speaking from a film standpoint, but movies I think as, as important as this one, because I do believe this is a really important film and for it to fall through the cracks like this, you know, and people are not seeing it. Because again, if anything, if, if, if the labor part of it or the, or the union part of it is dated, certainly the feminism part isn't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that I part is like, that, You know, to me, like watching it again, it's like, I, to me, there's a bigger story being told that I think would appeal to folks, even if they didn't know anything about unions, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a story of power, right? And the complexities of power mm -hmm. and people who, really just they don't want rich they don't want riches you know they do want yeah. radios but they yeah, yeah. they don't they want lives with dignity mm -hmm. and i think that is why you know that word dignity to me like that is so profoundly impactful at the end and i do think that is a universal message i mean that is like you know that is a, a, a message for Native Americans, for the Asian Americans, for you know African Americans, for working class whites, for women, you know, for trans folks. Like that message really does connect us. Um, that everybody deserves to live lives with dignity, wow. and that is a definitely a message for today, yeah. for this moment. We you want know. bread and roses, right? That's the slogan yeah. of the WW. We want bread yeah. and roses. It's like yeah. Esperanza yeah. with the radio. She doesn't yes, just exactly. bread. She wants a radio, right? She wants a radio, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and, and plumbing. <laughs> right. That would be well, like bread to me. That's not a, we ain't asking for a lot. Like you say, a radio and some plumbing. Or water. You know, when I was just, you know, in, in Michigan with the Flint water crisis. Oh, right. No. And the idea that, like, you know, the the denial of basic services, like what's happening in Mississippi. You know, it's like folks, you know, the, I think this message of dignity and that that is the right of every single human being to expect and have is a, is a message that is as close to a universal message as we can get. Yeah. Is that the most important lesson in the film you think, Maria? To About me dignity? it is. I mean, to me it is because dignity can, it's, you know, it's, it, it can mean different things for different people. There are different stakes in this. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, to me, that is the overarching message. So to me, it's less of a labor film than a film about, you know, um, how communities in struggle come to, to, you know, understand themselves of people deserving basic human, you know, dignity when, when they had accepted, both the women had accepted certain bad treatment from the men, the laborers had accepted to a certain extent, bad treatment from the bosses. Mm -hmm. And the struggle for dignity becomes to me the, the central animating struggle that links these two things. What's the, what, what, what about you, Gary? What's the most important lesson from the film? I, I, I think Maria summed it up pretty well. I think, I think it's hard to be, <laughs> hard to follow that. I, I'm going to second what she said. All right. Uh, uh, Layla says here that uh, our, what we were just talking about reminds her of uh, Esperanza's beautiful lines when she explained that the house is not theirs, but the flowers are. Yeah. yeah. Esperanza has some really beautiful lines. She really did. She, she did. She did. Well, wow, this has been great. So that's, 
that's all the questions I have for you all. Let's see, does, does our audience members have any questions they'd like to ask uh, Gary and Maria about the film? You've done such a good job. There's Thank nothing you. left to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mom, wh wh what do you have to add? Mom, I know you have something to ask. Yeah, mom, when was the first time you saw uh, Salt of the Earth and what did you think? Um, I guess the first time was 66, 1966, uh, wow. when we were organizing the Great Boycott uh, here in, in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I, I think I have a copy somewhere. Everybody has a copy wow. somewhere. <laughs> I, I know I have a copy. Uh, and my only, well, I have a lot of observations. I love that quote. You know, I love that quote. You know, the house may, must not may not be ours, but the flowers are, and and I wanted to encourage uh, Maria about L.A. Okay, that's exactly what it's all about. We we may not have what we wish we would have, but we have what is very important to us, and that is, you know, nuestra cultura, nuestro arte. Um, it, whatever we want to do with uh, the education of our children. And you know what? We can wait. And um, if LA sees us as landscapers and domestics, that's fine. Because here in Austin, landscapers and domestics got ourselves a beautiful cultural center. We have a beautiful Mexican museum. We have La Peña. And, and we work every day to nurture the flowers. You know, and I and I think, um, you know, a home or a house, a building is just a building. But I think that um, that we have what it has, what it takes um, in terms of dignity. You know, in terms of staying power, uh, because you know, having what nurtures your soul and spirit, I think, is is what keeps you alive and creative and blooming. Uh, but I also want to say that we used um, uh, salt of the earth. And, and as you all were commenting, Gary, uh, Mark, Maria, uh, about the use of the film as consciousness racing, uh, it was very, saddened me very much because of the women's, white women's movement, mainstream movement went mm -hmm. way off kilter. And only the very fortunate that were sleeping with the fortunate, you know, got anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, I mean, it's been grassroots women climbing up that steep hill for over 35 years that's made the woman come, the movement come alive. But I think that had these white women had the, the intellect in the ganas. I don't tell the truth. Show films like this <laughs> in their meetings, the way we showed films like this in our meetings, mm -hmm. you know, where we could, uh, we could look at class issues as well as gender issues uh, and other economic issues, of course, uh, I think it would have been a different movement. And, mm -hmm. and I'm very happy uh, to say that I, I don't remember a single decent civil rights and Chicana feminist conference that didn't show this film. <laughs> right. Wow. That's my case. Yeah. Wow. Right. So I, I think that's a really important wow. point because yes, it has disappeared. I agree, you know, from our like film history consciousness, but it is canonical uh, for the history of Chicana feminism. And it, it, you know, was central to organizing and consciousness raising. And like I said, it's in every newspaper, reviews of it are everywhere. There is, she's right. I've seen all, uh, many conference programs. There's always a showing of salt in the earth, of the earth. So yes, it is. It for us, it's part in you know really ingrained in our Chicana feminist memory. Mom, where, mom, where were you when I was taking history in college? <laughs> I should have been in your class. <laughs> she did. She she. My mom says that at ACC, uh, her students would tell her, "Hey, I want to take your class because you you your class in Texas history because that's the or Western history of the West because that's." where the uh, Indians and Mexicans win. And women. It would <laughs> <laughs> How the West was won. I was like, is that right? Is that a, yes. what they used to say? <laughs> and and, and, uh, and I was dismissed for the very same reason. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, don't do like she did, guys. <laughs> oh, wow. 
Mm -hmm. Man, I love it. I love it. Wow. Some of what the, the best some of the best people have fired my mother. <laughs> well, we have new leadership at ACC and there you go. Tell us. Yeah, we have new leadership at ACC and new director of the um, you know, of, of our center, Latin Latin Latina, Latin No American yeah. Center. So uh, and we will coordinate together and bring you. Bring you peace and coffee study yeah, center. Hope. We need to hear more from you, Martha. Yes, we do. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. That's what mom said. They didn't have the intellect. I, was like, oh. Oh. I love it. I love it. This has been wonderful. I have enjoyed this so, so much. Is well, there anybody else have any questions? Mom, you shut it down. No, no, no. It dropped you the mic. Mic. <laughs> mic drop. Oh, man. Well, Sharon, I'll turn it back over to you then. Well, it's hard to follow, Martha. Um, <laughs> yes. But thank you so much, all of you. This was, um, I'm glad we've recorded it because many people who missed it, I think once they watch the film, they want to know more. And this, this is the absolute perfect kind of conversation to have. I feel like I, I learn a lot. I uh, the film is still relevant. Sadly, it is all the themes are still relevant. And yeah. it uh, makes me think about, you know, a lot of the, what was going on in the film makes me think about how in peace, the discipline of peace studies, we define peace. There is negative peace, which we want still which mm -hmm. means the absence of active violence, direct violence. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's positive peace that is required in order to sustain peace. And that's mm -hmm. basically like social justice. So mm -hmm. if the white mine workers have plumbing and have hot water coming to the kitchen mm -hmm. and the Mexican Americans don't have it, then that community does not have positive peace. And that was one of the things that the film brought up. Mm -hmm. They kept talking about like, they have it, but we don't. Mm -hmm. um, so that the community was out of balance and something needed to happen. There was conflict that had to happen to transform that community and build something better. Mm -hmm. And um, we, you know, we talk about in conflict transformation, these kinds of things don't happen really quickly. So you don't get a, to have a meeting with the big boss and say, well, we demand it's not fair. And they say, okay, um, so <laughs> yeah. it needs to be kind of an um, iteration you know, so I, it's a fantastic film and a really great um, thing that you brought to us and the discussion was perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, Gary and uh, Maria, look, I, all these notes I have here for everything <laughs> you said, so I'm going to be busy this weekend looking up all of these stuff. I hope I spell these names right, so. <laughs> uh, well, Mark, I want to have a weekly film chat with you. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I would love uh, that. I thought of that Toni Morrison thing too. I mean, I, we, we're thinking alike here. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> good deal. I love yeah. it. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Maria. It was great to, to be here and do this with you guys. Martha, your your words were awesome as well. So yes. awesome. thanks to everybody, the whole team, Sharon, as well. Uh, you guys yeah. I love, yeah, I'm so lucky to be in your presence, Mom. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, awesome. well, thank you so much. Thank you, Alan. Please join us for the next one. Um, Layla put the link to our next um, next session. Okay. Uh, and so we would love to have you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Layla. Thank you, Sharon. Appreciate you. Thank you, Mark. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good night.